its time, that was, a, that was the most amazing car. The meticulous effort that went into bonding everything together and, and getting it so finite. You are looking back on a significantly competitive Grand Prix car from the 1992 season that simply was the pace setter, 10 Grand Prix victories from 16 starts and both world championships put to bed comfortably before the end of the year. Nigel was a serious top level driver. I had that understanding with the car that if it wasn't just perfect, I could drive around the problem. It was an animal. The FW14B is an evolution of the 1991 car, the FW14, and the main feature that signifies the B specification is the upgrade to the active ride suspension system for the 1992 season. Well, the car was good aerodynamically, which was mainly down to Adrian Newey, but it had lots of Williams qualities, so it was basically a good car that was then enhanced by the active ride system. I believe the active program had started to come on stream. Uh, obviously it raced in 87, but you'd started the program before. Somebody here mentioned that there was a bit of inspiration from an ambulance. I always wanted to do an active suspension. You know, we didn't have the money and the resource, but then some guy showed up who'd worked for an automotive product, and he got this hydraulic self-leveling suspension system that he'd originally designed when he was working at Lucas for ambulances. It basically, we kicked off a an active suspension system right. and the control system was entirely mechanical on this thing and we tried to emulate that but we didn't have any success with that so we changed it to electronic. It was a three-legged stool system so you, whatever you do with the car you never have corner weights going all over the place. The, the car could stick on, sit on the ground like that and the corner weight would still be perfect. project that had got ahead of itself and that they decided to take to a race. The car was raced at Monza and it had won the race and I think at that point Frank, that's Frank Durney that is, thought you know hang on we ought to have some some people to manage this thing. The thing was once it started looking like it was going to be good using subcontractors again we were thinking we didn't want that skirt experience again so I started looking for people who would do want to, so we'd actually make our own hardware box. I wanted our own controller and I wanted someone to write the software. After he'd interviewed me, he also interviewed Steve Wise. Frank realised he needed engineers. So I advertised and those were the two guys that I hired. Paddy's probably the cleverest guy I've ever hired and Steve was just fantastic on the hardware. And we ended up with a controller which was just fantastic. You know, having that ability to create reliable wiring harnesses reliable sensor installations, good solid hydraulic systems that didn't leak, that didn't get contaminated. All the people that surround that to support that, who, who needed that specialist knowledge, which was all new. So we, we brought all of that up um, and within that context we applied the active suspension and then a number of other systems like the, the automatic gearbox, um, then the traction control and that all really came together in 92 when, when uh, we had that sort of perfect assembly of, of these new weapons. I also hear you had a go at driving the active... Well, I was the first person to ever drive the first system, yeah, because really? nobody else wanted to drive it in case it did what Lotuses kept doing, which was raising their wheels off the ground. And it was in the wet, on slicks, and we turned the boost down as low as it could possibly go, wound the wastegates right open, and the clutch seal was leaking. Okay. So we could bleed the clutch, yep. and I could then get into first and set off, but after that, no clutch. So I had to change gear without the clutch. So you can imagine how much fun that was. The biggest problem with the Active is when it went wrong, it failed, it could kill you. 
it'll just throw you off the track and you had no control. One wheel just come up, whatever, and just go bang, straight into the barriers. Very disconcerting, but you know, it was a complete team effort with Ricardo, Damon and myself. And it wasn't until we had a fail safe system where when it failed, it went, it failed everything together. So then it went rock hard, but then you didn't have wheels jumping all over the place. So it felt like you went straight onto concrete. It failed, obviously you couldn't continue, but it didn't then kill you or try to kill you. Damon was, was our driver for the, for the test program. Yeah. He was our research and development driver in effect. And uh, we really enjoyed working with Damon. You know, he's, he's a very clever guy as well as a fantastically quick driver. Um, so he, he, was, he was just what we needed on the active project at that stage. What was it like? Because, you know, they didn't have the telemetry and the data and it was all down to driver feel a lot of it at the time, wasn't it? It was brilliant because there was just lots and lots of toys to play with. Yeah. The car could do anything. Um, it, was a, it was really a platform control. Um, but the, the ride was controlled to within ridiculous yeah. tolerances. And when you look at photographs of the car going yeah. around, it's, there's, there's, it looks like the suspension's collapsed. It, there's no clearance. I drove the car the, the first time in Estoril, I think, in a winter test. And the grip immediately, I could feel it was more than the, than the, the, uh, the passive car. This is because the car was producing more downforce, because of the fact that it was always uh, very level uh, yeah. and uh, it was like to be uh, always in a wind tunnel. In 91, uh, the, the car, uh, the active started uh, to be tested, uh, yeah. especially uh, with Demon, Demon Hill, that was the active uh, test driver. And we had the 91 car that was, I think, the best car I, I, I drove in my really? career. Yes, it was a very uh, um, predictable car. Uh, I got the best feeling, uh, really, uh, from that car. You had a lot of pole position. Yes, uh, the car was very quick. Unfortunately, we suffered a lot in the first part of the season with, uh, with the gearbox, uh, that uh, we had the automatic uh, gearbox, the first car in Formula 1 to, to have this, uh, because the other teams, they were testing the automatic gearbox, but they, they didn't, uh, they were not able to put uh, in, uh, in racing. Right. But in 91 we could do it, but unfortunately we had a little bit of reliability problem, especially the, four, the first four races. Then after that it, it became better and we started to win Grand Prix and pole position. It was relentless testing and if I can't remember it's because there was so much stuff happening um, that you just really didn't, by, by the end of a week's testing you had no idea what you'd done because you'd, yeah. been, you'd tried everything from brakes to engines to, to suspension to aerodynamics, you know, and it was, and tyres of course, and it was just relentless lapping. We actually were testing in, in Ricard fairly late on and we'd actually already made the decision to race the, the active system. We, we noticed on the main straight there that the passive car was actually quicker on end of straight speed by two or three kilometres an hour. And this was something we hadn't spotted before, even though the lap time was stronger on the active car. And we realised that the passive car was actually stalling itself. The floor was stalling at the end of the straight as it, as it reached a much lower ride height. And because the active car didn't uh, go down to that ride height yeah. because it maintained attitude, it wasn't stalling and the stall was allowing a, a reduced, reduction in the induced drag. The car was always keeping uh, a, a, an attitude, uh, nose down and rear up uh, to have the yeah. best efficiency uh, for uh, the aerodynamic, for the corners, for yeah. the corners but the, this uh, was uh, giving uh, like a, a parachute effect yeah. in the straight. So we had uh, to make a program uh, that uh, the car in the straight uh, pressing a button Wow. Uh, it was uh, changing the attitude, the nose was coming up and the rear was going down, even more than the wow. passive car. So we were losing four or five uh, kilometers with the old car, uh, compared with the old cars. With this new system, we were gaining 10 kilometers more <laughs> than the other cars, so it was like a it's rocket. Incredible. So this is where we invented the button, which in a way was the first DRS. Sure. Um, and this was, this was the low drag button that the driver would use to literally stall the floor oh, okay. down the straight. And um, the drivers used it on every straight, if they remembered. <laughs> and um, they had to remember to release it before the braking point. 
uh, which Nigel didn't always remember to do because he, he, he liked to push things harder. <laughs> Beginning part of the year when the car was testing before the first race, it was like, what's going to happen? We invented traction control in, in late 91 and it literally was one, one line of software. It was a very, very simple system to implement once we had the right things in place. We introduced it with very little in the form of trials. Um, so, but we just ran it and it cut cylinders to, to reduce the torque and we ran it for quite a few of the winter tests. But by the time we got to Kyle Army for the first race, I think Renault only then were waking up to the point that there would be some reliability risk with this. So during the race they were saying, you know, you mustn't use it. And actually Nigel didn't run traction control in, in Kyle Army 92. Um, Ricardo was struggling a bit more for pace and I think if you go and look at the footage you'll find that there were occasions when I, I think it was Ayrton uh, would catch him up and then he'd switch the traction control on <laughs> and open the gap up again and then the Renault guys would come running out to the pit wall and say tell him to switch off the traction control so we'd put a board out or, or call him on the radio to, so he'd switch it off and then Ayrton would catch up again. And this, this happened three or four times in the race, but he used it anyway enough to, to get the second position. I mean, what, what was it like to work on? Because active suspension was so revolutionary that year. We know there's a, you know, a huge test program with Paddy Lowe and Damon and stuff, but I mean, were there a lot of all-nighters for you guys? There was. Um, I think it was the norm in those days, you know, um, that you did work till two, three o'clock in the morning and then come back to the circuit at six. But actually working on the car, it wasn't difficult. It was just different. There were mm. so many procedures that we never had before that you just had to follow the procedures. And for the first time ever, the electronics people were telling the mechanics what to do. Previously, there was one electronics engineer and you told him when you wanted them to work on the car. Now the roles have been reversed and the electronics people were telling the mechanics what they could do, which and went down quite yeah. strangely. <laughs> but I mean, all the mechanics had these little Zion computers in it as well, didn't they? In their, in their sort of hand, Paddy was telling me to, to help program the car. Yeah, um, there was a really like a manual. Um, Paddy and the other guys had written a manual, and so um, the mechanics had to go through training to use these Zions that they'd never used before. Um, to do anything on the car, you'd do something and then plug the Zion in and make sure that was at the correct reading. You know, just pull the gearbox on and off. There was a, a Zion plugged in just to make sure the clutch row was correct. And let's, let's give people some perspective. I mean, how many people were you on the team compared to what they've got now? Oh, probably, I think, somewhere around 25 people. Yeah, and uh, today there's more than double of that. That's uh, I think there's more like 80, 90 people. And Nigel, what was he, what was he like? Because obviously he dominated the season winning. Ni Nigel had total faith in the car. Um, a lot of people forget that Nigel did all the active ride work at Lotus, all the development at Lotus. So when this car came in, he knew what to expect. Whereas Ricardo, it was new for him. You know, suddenly he lost the feel of springs and dampers. And there was a hydraulic system there propping the car up. And it does feel totally different, so they tell me. Nigel was a serious top-level driver uh, and I don't think we quite realised that when we took him on in 1985 uh, but it did become very clear quite soon that that was the case and uh, he won 29 of his 31 Grand Prix at Williams so quite significant success. Hey, Nigel was on fire that year. I, I said before that a number of things had come together in terms of systems on the car um, which all together about maybe two, two and a half seconds a lap of new technology we put on that car from the year before. Um, but, but this was Nigel's year. And, and there was something about the car that really suited Nigel's style. Nigel is a very, very brave driver. Um, probably the bravest driver I, I worked with. Um, and that suited the car. Because the car was a car that, that rewarded huge faith I would say, 
Um, very typical would be a corner like Copse at Silverstone, where um, it, it, it could in theory almost be flat, um, but you would have to have the confidence that that was possible. And the, the trouble with that car was the more you lifted, the more you lost downforce and the slower you went. Conversely, the more you could stay in the throttle, the more downforce you had and the, more you, the, the quicker you could go around the corner. And as an example, in, in Silverstone that year, um, Nigel went 25 kilometres an hour quicker through cops than he had ever done in the build-up in practice on that pole lap and 40 kilometres an hour quicker than Ricardo through that same corner. Ricardo uh, was very fast, faster I would say in the passive FW14 than he was relative to Nigel in the uh, 14B. I don't think the active ride car gave him the feedback that he was looking for, but he was a, a real gentleman and a pleasure to have in the team. What were your feelings ahead of the Grand Prix? I'm glad you asked that because that was a really, really special weekend in my whole Formula One career because this was the launch of, of this car, the first race had been five or six year build up to that. The emotions were incredible because on the one point we, we first met McLaren at this event. So they had chosen not to do any common track tests with anyone else. They'd, they'd gone private testing all winter. So nobody knew how quick they were. Uh, as it turned out, that was more their loss than ours. Um, so when we went out in the first practice, you know, we were massively quicker than them. And I thought, well, you know, they're, they're just sandbagging this or there's some issue. And as the weekend developed, each session by session, and we were always quicker, just this gradual realization came that actually, you know, here we, we are quicker than McLaren. <laughs> And, and it's difficult to describe that fully. Imagine McLaren have won um, 88, 15 out of 16, yeah. 89, 90, 91, a little bit more of a struggle, but they, they were such a difficult team to ever imagine you could beat in those days. And here we were with a car that was hugely quicker than theirs, um, but that only, you only gained the confidence in that fact as the days went by through that race weekend. Yeah. So that was an incredible feeling of, of reward. And then it came to the race, and I remember standing on the grid and actually feeling physically sick, <laughs> just because I knew all the things that could go wrong. And, and here was the moment. You know, it's one thing to go and do thousands and thousands of kilometers around a test track. Um, but to, for an actual race where you know it's going to be on TV, the driver expects, the team expects, everyone expects, um, and I knew all the pitfalls. So we were celebrating our one-two um, in the garage, and I, I got a, a tap on the shoulder. You're, you're wanted in Park Fermi. That was my first meeting with Charlie Whiting. I'd never come across Charlie until that day. Um, bear in mind. You know, we're a lot more familiar with the rules and all the processes now than, than was the case back then. It was, it was really um, so much simpler, I would say. So I went down to Park Ferme and there was a problem with the cars that they were, they were sitting nose up right. uh, with effectively at minimum ride height on the rear and maximum on the front. And the reason for this was that um, the cars had been wheeled from one end of the pit lane to the other. The drivers had stopped the at the podium end and then the part frame was the other end and they'd wheeled them all the way down. And when the car was stopped, we had a valve that, that sealed all the oil in the system so that the car didn't collapse onto the ground. But it was only one valve and there was a way that if, if you disturbed the car with, with small bumps as you'd get wheeling it along, gradually the oil would shuffle from the from the rear row into the front, and the car would uh, move itself to pitch up. And the problem now was, in those days, the, guitar, the car was measured to the ground, not on, we have the, what we call the table of doom now. All measurements, all, all dimensional measurements are made to the reference plane on the frame, so this problem wouldn't occur nowadays. In those days, it was measured to the physical ground. And the problem was the rear wing 
uh, the, the box had uh, the, the rear wing top rear edge had gone out of the box because of yeah. this so I had to say to Charlie look Charlie it will be fine if I can start the engine um, and get it all powered up in the right condition again and when it started I have to move this switch from here to here um, which would enable the suspension and of course that seemed really dodgy yeah. as a request a, a switch to put it back in the legal legal state <laughs> Um, but fortunately, Charlie was, was very understanding. This is not a well-known fact, but the 14B was 20, 25 kilos overweight all year. I was lucky enough in 1992 to attend several races that in hindsight were quite key moments. I was there in Monaco. The atmosphere in those last six or seven laps when people initially realised what was building. Mansell recovering after an unplanned pit stop, chasing down Senna, and then the three or four laps to the chequered flag where they were literally nose to tail. That was a pretty pivotal moment of excitement for 1992, but sadly, despite being dominant, we were on the losing end that day, something quite rare for Williams that season. But I can remember watching Nigel winning races and feeling an enormous sense of pride that I'd, you know, I'd worked on that car yeah. with him and he, there he was cleaning up uh, and uh, winning lots of races and, and I knew everything about the team and what was going on with the car and so this, you know, seeing the success of those cars, um, you, you, you know, you're getting that sense of being part of a team. Yeah. But um, I didn't have the the onerous, really kind of stressful job of having designed the, the, the car and having that pressure. Um, you know, we forget, don't we, how, how yeah. difficult it is for them to send out, you know, they're, they're asked, is it going to be all right? And they go, yeah. they've done their maths and they've done their software and they're going, yeah, it's going to be fine. But deep down, they're probably thinking, I hope, I hope it's right. You know, nothing was going to beat him that year the way he could he worked with the car and and the confidence he had you know I don't know if you've ever seen Nigel's steering wheel he just drives with the wheel you know about two-thirds the diameter of anyone else and there was no power steering in those days um, and Nigel's neck would run from here straight you know he would he was not particularly fit drivers were not fit in those days they didn't train like they do now um, but he was immensely strong as strong as an ox and he liked the small wheel because he could turn it quickly yeah, even though it took a lot of force um, and that allowed him to, to make huge corrections at, at, and get the car out of any trouble and again that, that was a great combination with this car. Ricardo, we spoke to him at Goodwood as well, said he, he didn't have the same trust in, in the, the active car as you did. You had, to, you had to have a relationship with the car that you could trust in and um, you probably know the story about Ricardo being incredibly unhappy, saying that he got a really bad car and I got a good car. Both uh, Sir Patrick and Sir Frank were brilliant uh, in um, Sao Paulo. I think it was a second race. And um, I persuaded them in second qualifying to swap cars with Ricardo because I wanted him to see that there was nothing in the cars. And if there was, I wanted to highlight for him that there was something wrong with his car. So on my first flying lap um, at Sao Paulo in the second qualifying, in his car, I was one and a half seconds quicker. It's, it's trust and commitment. I mean, the, the problem is you have, to, you have to drive through a problem with the active car. Uh, it's like when you've got understeer. You know, first thing you do with understeer, the first feeling you want to do with understeer is come off the throttle to get the front to grip again to turn in. However, if you're able to drive through the understeer, you'll get oversteer because then the back end will kick out. Um, I had that commitment. I had that understanding with the car that if it wasn't just perfect, I could drive around the problem. I didn't have a problem with it because I had the brute strength of carrying the car. Um, but I mean, yeah, it was it was an animal. You know, yeah, I've never had so many elation feelings and disappointments. The best year was '92 because we finished yeah. first and second in the championship. It was a dreaming car. To you, was it the perfect car? Renault did an absolutely superb job with the engine, uh, the gearbox, and the reliability of the gearbox, and the mechanics, the engineering. The, um, uh, 
the, uh, the makers of the front wings, the rear wings, it's just phenomenal. You cannot stop the progress of, of great engineering and Formula One is, a, is really a crucible of great engineering and, and, and so it's proved to be we've, we've developed from then on. But I see the 14B as really you know, a, a turning point, the first introduction of, of that new era of complex Formula One cars.